You are listening to From Sobriety to Recovery with Jesse Mogul, episode 144. Let's get to the show. Welcome back to From Sobriety to Recovery. I am your host, Jesse Mogul, and I am in addiction recovery. Boy, oh boy, boy, oh boy, I've been sitting on these two for a little bit too long, and now my brain is just flowing. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to jump right into it first and foremost, and I really hope that everybody out there is having a happy holiday if you are listening to this linearly. If not, and this is you finding it in the archives, then awesome. Welcome, and let's get right into it. Now, episode 144 and 145, I'm not really sure about the order I want to put them in and whether one would be more beneficial before the other, but they're really a compendium. They they go together like peas and carrots. And so I'm going to talk first about understanding how when you set goals, making sure they're internalized for you and benefiting you because when things are for you, you'll follow through with them. And then I'm going to do episode 145 about who are you being while you're getting there. And I really am fired up about the who are you being while you're getting there episode. But in my head, I feel like talking about how goals should be internalized would come before the who are you being while you get there, I think. Um, But either way, um, you have your choice of the order you will listen to them. And so let's get right into it because I don't want these to turn into 45 minute long diatribes. So I'm really going to treat them as an hour long episode broken up into two. So they're going to be going together in a way. So let's talk about all of the things that we have discussed over the last couple of weeks. You're, you know, we've discussed you are not what you do. And that the reason why you're not what you do is because if you were, then you would be who you, what you've already done. You would be that old version of yourself and you would be locked into it. So you're no more only a postman. You're no more only a school teacher. You're no more only an oil field worker or a healthcare provider. That's just what you're doing as a job. But that's not your identity. Now, in America, we have a lot of our identity wrapped up in the jobs that we have, and we hear what somebody's doing, and there's like a this almost a shotgun reaction to judging somebody based off of the job that they have, when that is not who they are. It's just what they do. Somebody could own a billion-dollar company and be a horrible human. That doesn't make them a good person. It makes them rich, and they look cool on Instagram, but it doesn't make them a good person. Equally, you could be you know, out there doing what some would consider a beneath them job, and yet you're a great person and you're awesome. I almost said garbage man as my, um, which is not a beneath you job. But I, I don't, remember back in the day, I used to use garbage man as a reference to a job that most people don't want. But then somebody out there, one of my listeners, and I'm hoping you're still around because I haven't heard you from in a while, actually had a job in waste management. And they wrote me a long message on Instagram about how it's not a horrible job and it's really great. And I absolutely agree. I mean, trust me, if there is a job that matters more in society than someone who helps uh, the the human race dispose of their refuse, you please point them out. Because I can guarantee you, if all of you people living in cities all of a sudden were had a, had a uh, garbage worker strike, you would immediately notice how much more important their job is than the CEOs of Coca-Cola. <laughs> it's much more important. And that's the point, right? You might hear garbage man and think, oh, that's beneath. Oh, God, why would you want to do that? It is literally one of the most important jobs on this planet. Because if we just took our stuff and put it out in front of our house and no one helped us out with that, it wouldn't take very long for the vermin to, to overtake us. So you have to be really mindful of how you... Um, compare what somebody is doing to what maybe you think you would want to do versus what you think an actual good job is. Because most of the jobs that we didn't think of as essential, right, we just sort of saw as, as quote unquote, the beneath us jobs, are actually the ones that when COVID hit were the most important. Nobody really cares what the CEO of Google is doing on any given day, but you sure as hell cared if somebody was able to be at the grocery store to swipe your groceries, that's a job that matters. That's an essential employee. Those are the people that should be heralded and applauded. But oftentimes we hear about their job and we think that's a less than job, but it's not. It's so crucial to society. I've said plenty of times that even if we all had college degrees, somebody needs to swipe your groceries. Somebody needs to uh, clean the, the school, clean the office. Somebody needs to take out the garbage. These jobs matter. 
and, there, and everybody on this planet has the role they've chosen to fulfill, and they play an important piece in this. We still need someone to run Coca-Cola if you care about beverages that are like that. You want those companies making those beverages. You also want somebody who can help you take out the trash and clean the school and your office. And so every job has a special place in society, and we have to honor those people who have chosen to do that. Everybody plays their part. We're a cog in a gigantic machine of industrialization, and everyone plays their role. So you can play your role, but still not attach your identity to the job you have. We talked about fear and people recognizing and understanding their changes and realizing that not everybody is necessarily going to recognize your changes and to be okay with that and know that the changes you're seeking within yourself are for yourself. When you internalize it first, you then can externalize it for other people to enjoy. And this is what we're going to be talking about today when it comes to making these goals that are for yourself. We talked about the passing of the baton, the masks we wear, emotions and understanding them, self-awareness and taking action. I mean, go back over. We did conflict avoidance. Cognitive dissonance has showed up in my tribe. We got a lot of people keep referencing back to conflict avoidance and and cognitive dissonance. And that's in that 134, 136 range. Um, I mean, the the story arc I've created for us in this show lately has been, I mean, looking back at it, it's, it's played out exactly how I had hoped it would because we're building on this new year, best year, highest sense of self, us. And part of it is releasing our identity around what other people might be thinking about us. All right, let's go back to the job thing. Like, seriously, CEO of a major company, garbage person. Choosing the garbage person every time because I know what it's like to live in the country and have to take your own refuse to the to the dump. It's tiring. It can be a little bit dirty and messy, and it absolutely means you better be taking that stuff out frequently because there are critters who will get in your stuff, and next thing you know, you've got garbage sprawled out all over your yard because the local raccoons decided that they were going to eat on that smorgasbord that you called garbage. Like, there are are absolutely people on this planet who are being overlooked for the impact that they're bringing into our lives. And we want to be honoring everyone and for what they do. And by honoring other people and what they do and, and the impact they have on our lives, it can then bounce back into us honoring ourselves for what we do and honoring ourselves for how we're up leveling our life. The choices we have been making since we got sober curious into sobriety, into addiction recovery, have been nothing short of phenomenal. And if you don't stop and turn around once in a while and look back at all of the amazing progress you've made, then you are missing out on the tiny little rewards that you have been offering yourself day in and day out that show you that you're on the right track. We all heard the analogy that there's a reason why the rear view mirror is smaller than the windshield because you should be looking forward. Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't mean that you should be negating anything that you've done that's now in the rear view mirror. In the rear view mirror is what got you to where you're at today. And the behaviors that you showed yourself can be ones that guide you toward, toward your best self tomorrow, but they won't necessarily dictate that you will make it to where you, you seek for tomorrow. Because each and every day, you're making the decisions that will create the tomorrow today. What you experience a year from now will be decided by the actions you take today. And having this idea that all actions are massive and obvious and, and very apparent to us, it's one, I don't think that it's actually attainable that every little single action you do has this monumental effect, right? It's like, if you go to take out the garbage, it's obvious you took it out. It's now, and now the, the, the trash receptacle is empty and it's got a new clean bag into it. That's an obvious thing that you've done. But if every time you used a piece of garbage in your house, you just left it where it was sitting, at first it might just be a couple little wrappers and plates and stuff like that here and there. But if you leave it for the course of a week, all of a sudden your house is a disaster, You've got empty pizza boxes and plates and glasses and a sink full of dishes, but it di- the sink didn't just massively become full of dishes in one second. It took you compiling them in there and not doing anything about it first. And then you look back over the course of a day or a week and you're like, wow, this got out of control quickly. But it didn't really get out of control quickly. It was one little step at a time that got it to look like it does now. 
So the way you can internalize keeping a house clean and tidy and having a big bag of garbage to take out is by making sure that every time you use something that needs to be thrown away, it ends up in the receptacle. Now let's take this analogy out of the garbage and kitchen and dishes world and bring it into our own lives. When you make these decisions about things that you want to do, you want to be doing them for yourself because you cannot expect the external people that you are hoping will be impressed by it or love you for it to give you or bring you or create for you the feeling that you're hoping because you have no control over how they're going to internalize it. You have none. None at all. It makes me remember a story. When I, first, I, when I left college, I moved in with my folks in Dallas. This was in 2007, right around um, September, October, right, yeah, right around August. And I remember my folks went to Hawaii for like two weeks, and I got left to the run of the house. And in this time, I just got myself super hammered and drunk the whole time, did nothing at all about looking for a job, getting my own money together, finding my own apartment. So a day or two before they came back, I decided that I was going to set up this whole little study area on the dining room table so that when my parents came home, that my dad's wife, which would be my stepmom, would see all of this stuff on the dining room table and know that I was working hard at getting a job and getting an apartment, getting my money in order and getting out of her house. I wanted her to see that I was serious and I, and I was working hard toward it, even though I really wasn't. I wanted to build this entire scene that showed her that I was. So they come home from the Hawaii vacation, and the very next morning, I end up sleeping until like noon, and because uh, we got super drunk and I was hungover, so I slept until noon. Well, she opened up that door and was not happy about that, and so right out of bed, I mean, just furious. You're not working. You're not looking for a job. You're not trying to do anything. I don't want you in my house, and this is how you're going to behave, and um, rightfully, she had all the right. It's her house. I, I moved there with the intention of getting my money in order, getting a place, and getting a job, and I'd been there since September, and now here we are. I think it was right around, right before Thanksgiving, so I'd done nothing for that, so very totally understandable. Um, I mean, was it the best way to re react? Uh, we're not going to judge. We're just going to say, I can absolutely see her point of view in this. And she's like, and then there's all this stuff on my dining room table, and I don't want this stuff scattered all over my dining room table, right? And what I thought she would see was, look at how hard Jesse's working, and he is he cares so much, and I'm, I'm going to pat him on the back and tap him on the head and tell him what a good little boy he is. Yes, she is. He's a good little boy. And this is not how it went down. In fact, how she took it was I was sprawling my crap out all over the place and I was leaving messes all over her house when I could just as easily have set that up in my room. I did something external hoping I would get a certain reaction or response and I didn't get it at all. In fact, it backfired and it went completely the opposite way. And I tell you this story to say that you, what you think is, is, is setting up a, a good intention or even trying to create this aura of having a good intention you can't control how it's internalized. It's going to be internalized however that person seeks to internalize it. And it's neither right or not right nor wrong. It's just the way that they do it. Right? To judge them and say, well, you should be seeing it this way is asinine because who are you to tell anybody what their subjective experience of life should be? Especially considering that they've been dealing with you for some amount of time. They've been coping with your addiction. They've been coping with your changes. And they're doing the best they can with the resources they have. But whatever they're doing in the moment isn't against you. It's for themselves. So if my stepmom wanted her house to be orderly and less chaotic, and then I created disorder and chaos, her yelling at me wasn't necessarily against me and my behaviors as much as it was for her to have the order and chaos she desired. She desired not to have a 31-year-old man staying in her house when she, whenever I could just as easily get an apartment down the street, get a job, become self-sufficient, and come over and visit whenever they wanted me to. She wasn't doing this against me. She was doing it for herself. And that's, what people, that's, that's where people get offended. That's where people get their feelings hurt. They think, well, I did, this, uh, I did this and I wanted you to give me a certain response and we don't get it. And then we think, well, then they don't like me. Well, they're not doing anything against you. Right? They're doing something for themselves. Your partner you know, draws a line in the sand and says, if you cross this, you're out of the house. It's not against you as much as it's for their own sanity or for their own comfort or for their own happiness. And it's really hard to judge somebody for wanting those things for themselves. So bringing this again back to what we're discussing today, 
when you start to set these goals out, it's going to be extremely important, and it is extremely important, and it has been extremely important, that you are setting goals down for yourself because it's in setting them for an internal growth that will actually cause them to stick. You'll actually continue to do them. If you make promises for other people, and now your goals are externalized, and then that person doesn't give you the response that you want, they don't heap praise upon you, then you might think, well, why was I even bothering to do this if I'm not going to get the reaction or the response that I want? So it was all for nothing? Well, then I'm just going to go back to my old behavior. But if you really wanted the change that you sought, then you would have stuck with it. So whatever they asked of you, you didn't figure out a way to connect it to something that you actually wanted inside of yourself. So here's how this would work. If somebody says, hey, you know what, I... You, I really want you to, I really want to be more connected with you um, at the dinner table. And that means every day we're going to eat dinner at five o'clock. All right. If that's not really, and you say okay to that, but you really don't want to make sure you're always eating dinner at five o'clock and you've, and you've done everything you can do to make sure that happens. And maybe it works for a few days and then eventually you fall off because it really wasn't what you wanted to do. But if you hear that person say, I really want to be more connected to you, and then they give you an option for how they could see that happen. And you really want connection too. Now you can say, oh, okay, well, what, how they want connection is through five o'clock dinners. Can I make that commitment? Or is it just five o'clock is an arbitrary time and what they really just want is consistent dinners at the table? So now can we be more fluid with the time, but the connection comes from the dinner table experience? Or does the connection come more from being on time to the, 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 the time they set? I said 5 o'clock. Maybe 5 o'clock could just be the time they want to go for a walk or sit down on the couch and have a heartfelt conversation. And maybe the dinner table is just the environment that they chose for this specific time period. And if what you're seeking is more connection, now it opens up the conversation to say, okay, I, could, I understand that the dinner table is where you would like to connect. Um, so let's create a window where, you know, from five to seven, we figure out a time each day and that's when we meet at the dinner table and that's how we connect. You wanted connection, right? And so you're offered an opportunity to create connection and this is how they are bringing in the idea. There's fluidity there if you open up the conversation to the fluidity. But if all you hear them say is, I want to have dinner at five o'clock and by God, you better be there or screw you and your connection. And you don't realize that they also want connection. They're just bringing to you their idea of, of how, when, and where that could happen. And you're not connecting the dots over to the fact that you too also want connection. Then you're going to think that the goal that you're agreeing to is external only, and you're not seeing the internal benefit for it. So when you look at somebody across from you and you want a deeper, more heartfelt connection with them, now the conversation can be opened up. You both want connection. Let's just go ahead and agree that that's the constant, that that's the unchanging variable in this example. You both want connection. Now, how do you create that connection? They're going to have their ideas for connection and you're going to have your ideas for connection. But if your ultimate goal is to have connection felt internally for you, which means that you're going to then be able to externalize it for them, allowing them to reap the benefits of you having this connection within you. Now they are also going to feel it externally toward them. How that is achieved, now that becomes the variable that can be uh, consistently changing. Perhaps the way you feel connected today is a walk. Tomorrow, perhaps it's coffee in the morning. The next day, perhaps it's dinner at the table. But you both seek connection. So how that connection changes can be, can be the, the uh, consistent changing variable, but the one variable that doesn't change is that we're seeking connection. So then you've internalized, I want to create connection with this person. How that's accomplished, that can be ever-changing. But no matter what they bring up or what you throw out as ideas, as long as you both agree that in that moment you can agree that connection is going to be the intention, now you've internalized connection as the goal. And no longer is the external demand or request from this other person just something that you're doing to placate them. You've actually drawn the dots over to how this will be beneficial for you too. There's a bit of a psychoanalysis of the situation here that obviously because we stepped into sobriety and recovery that we're consistently doing in other areas of our lives. So the key point here is to, is to be able to realize that what is being shown externally can be connected internally 
with self-awareness, with this level of emotional management and relationship management and social awareness that we're stepping into by making emotional intelligence one of our priorities every single day. If somebody else says, I want you to lose 20 pounds, right, and you don't really want to lose 20 pounds, but you agree to it, then there's an external promise you've made. In, internally, you just don't want to do it. So you might keep up with it a little bit or create this big, huge, fabricated, you know, mischievous way of explaining your way to them how you're actually doing it, even though you're really not. So why even jump through all those hoops? Why spend so much effort not working when you could just spend probably half as much effort just getting it done? But if what you're seeking to get done isn't something that you're 100% committed to, it's only a matter of time before you start to drop it off. And then internally, we feel like we're not keeping our promises to ourselves. All right, this goes back to Don Miguel Ruiz's four agreements that I talked to back in like the teens or 20s of this show, where as addicts, we broke a lot of promises to ourselves. So our trust bank is a lot lower. Right? This was actually brought up by one, of, by one of my tribal members the other day. He's like, I don't have a whole lot of trust in my trust bank. I've got to build it up. So I was like, okay, cool. Every day do something vigorous, right? We, we came to this idea that every day do one minute, five minutes, 15 minutes of something vigorous to start to build up that trust within yourself that you can commit to being more healthy in wh- however you want to experience more healthy. I might think it's 10,000 steps. You might think that it's just um, getting up off the couch five times a day and walking around your living room. Whatever it looks like for you, each time you do that, you start to build more trust and you start to build upon that. And then five months from now, you're outside running miles where, you know, today you're happy with walking circles in your living room. You don't know where you're going to get to until well into the journey of getting there. And in order to continue on the journey of getting there, the promises you're making, these goals that you're setting have to be internally beneficial for who it is you want to become before you're going to be able to externalize them in a way where you can actually hold to those promises. If someone says, this is what I want from you, and even if that's also, like, you're like, you're right, I'd like to cut back on my drinking. All right, I want you to cut back on your drinking because I think you're a drunk, hot mess when you're drunk. And you're like, I'm right, I am a drunk, hot mess, right? Now, that's away from language, and we are mindful of that, but okay, you want to get away from being a drunk, hot mess. Your spouse and partner, they want you to get away from being a drunk, hot mess. But if they have their reasoning for it and you have yours and you haven't drawn that connection, then if you're using their reasoning internally for you, they're not going to feel as compelled to keep to continue to follow through. I'm so excited about this topic. I can barely get my words out. So how are you going to internalize this stuff for you? Well, let's go back to what we discussed about in uh, the beginning of all of this where we pass the baton. Right? We talk about the three spheres of career self-relationships the four pillars of each sphere, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. When we combine these, we come up with these 12 rooms of our McMansion of life, these 12 quadrants that we can be working on at any time. You've got your, because the pillars are underneath each sphere. So in the end, if you write them out on a piece of paper, you've got career, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. You've got self, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And you've got relationships, physical, emotional, mental, spiritual. And that's 12 quadrants. That's 12 rooms. So when you start to brain dump all these different ways that you can up-level each one of these quadrants of your life, each one of these rooms, you can remodel each one of these rooms in your house. I really just want it to be a brain dump. Get everything out. Because the faster you can get it out and on paper, the more you can actually see all the different opportunities that you have. And a lot of these might seem mundane, taking out the garbage, emptying out the dishwasher, and you may not even necessarily know where to put it. Is emptying the dishwasher more physical for myself or is it more physical for the relationship? And in reality, it's for both. Oftentimes, not often, damn near every single time. I, actually, I might be able to use a universal qualifier here. Every time you go to work on one quadrant, one room in your house, it will actually leak into and flow into even other quadrants other rooms. You can't work on physical self 
without also being working on physical, emotional, uh, or I'm sorry, um, self-emotional um, and, and self-mental. It's like if you're out there doing self-physical and you go to the gym and you're working out, you're also feeling better about yourself. You're feeling super pumped up. While you're sitting there working out, you're thinking about all these cool things you're going to do or something that you heard on my podcast or read in a book. Now you're working on mental. So you went to the gym to work on self-physical, but you're making yourself feel better about yourself so that you're, you up-leveled your emotions and you're making yourself uh, think about other things and so now you're up-leveling your mentality. You're also working on self-spiritual because your, your, your morals, ethics, and values are being portrayed back at you because you made a promise to go to the gym and work out and now you are. So that's, so there's, there's your value of hard work. There's your morality of keeping your promises to, to yourself. You cannot work on one room without working on many others is my point. So as you begin to write out all of these goals for next year, I want you to really make sure that the ones you're writing down are internalized visions for yourself. Now, what somebody else wants from you is going to be easily, easily dotted over once you get it out of your head and you start to see what it is you want and then how it is that what they want actually correlates with what you want. Sounds a little ridley there, so I'll, I'll get us out of here on this to make sure that I'm clear. If my partner or your partner or a loved one in your life wants more connection, wants to see that you care about them, they are gonna. They may not even know how they want to see it, but they know that they'll feel it when it happens. And if what you want is to have a better relationship and a stronger emotional openness with them, then. If you say, okay, what I seek is connection and love with this person. If you start to behave in a way that you think shows them connection and love, right? Then they will, whether they feel it or not, you know you're being that version of yourself, right? You may not get the response you want in the moment that it happens, but the more you do it, the more they start to realize, oh, okay, this is something that they're seeking to make consistent. So this is something that I could you know, hopefully begin to enjoy long term. The key is they wanted connection and growth. You wanted connection and growth, right? So however they might think they want to see it or however they might say they want to see it to you, if they say, well, I want to see it by you doing five handstand push-ups every day, you might think it's ridiculous. But if your goal is connection and growth, and what they said is they want connection and growth through five handstand push-ups every day, you can actually attach that as one of your goals because now what you're hearing is, I do five handstand push-ups every day, you'll feel connection and growth. And you want them to feel connection and growth. Therefore, when you do the five handstand push-ups, you will feel connection and growth because that's what they had asked of you in order for them to feel connection and growth. I get that we can't demand or ex- expect people to always feel the way we want them to feel when we do things. But if they strategically ask you for something, then that's a pretty good... At- that's a pretty good idea that that's going to help with what it is they're seeking from you. And in this instance, connection and growth. So it may not have been what you think you could do for connection and growth, but it is what they're asking from you for connection and growth. And if what you seek with them is connection and growth, then they've just given you a roadmap. A roadmap doesn't tell you you have to follow it, but it certainly gives you the most advantageous way of following a path in order to get where you want to go effectively and efficiently. You can take a ton of side roads. Trust me, Waze knows how to dick you around to save you a minute. Or you can just stay on the one main road you know will get you there and not have to worry about all these turnoffs and four-way stop signs. So when somebody asks of you something and says, well, I will absolutely feel this if you can do this for me, you might have an internal pushback because that's not how you would have done it, but they literally handed you a roadmap for how they would like to see it done. Start to do it that way, and perhaps it changes over the course of time, but ultimately, we're seeking, again, we're seeking flexibility, but ultimately, they've at least given you a good first step. And in all goals, all tasks, everything we want to accomplish is started with that first step. If sobriety and recovery doesn't happen overnight, it starts with one step. It starts with that sober, curious idea where you start to question your your beliefs and your values and your actions. And then over the course of years, you finally get to the point where you've had enough. And then you take this gigantic leap and you're thinking, man, I stopped cold turkey overnight. I just gave up booze. Mm. Man, you thought about this for a long time. It took you a long time to get to the point where you're ready to start the journey of sobriety into addiction recovery. 
the, the journey of, of accomplishing these goals or healing your relationships or getting your body back in shape or getting your career back in, online, whatever that might look like, it's these tiny little steps you take every single day that will get you there. So when you start to create these goals of things that you want to do in order to reach the healthy relationship, in order to reach the career back online, in order to achieve this healthier body. When you say, what are the goals that I'm going to set for myself in order to be, get to that point, right? These goals have to be things that you've internalized and you make sure that they're, they're for you, that you understand how they are for you. They can benefit other people, right? Because that's going to happen. Every, we're, we're humans. We have people in our lives. The things that we decide to internalize as our goals can benefit other people. But if we don't attach an internal meaning for why we want to be doing it, then it's not going to maintain. It's in the consistency that the maintaining goes from being maintenance to just habit. And if we're being mindful of these habits that we're creating that bring us to connection, that bring us to a healthier body, that bring us to a, uh, a better uh, sense of accomplishment at work, if we're keeping our eyes on the prize and we're knowing that who we're, and this is going to go into who we're being when we get there, it's the next episode, then we'll be very mindful of who we're being each and every day that we get there. And then we can internally evaluate what is it we did today in order to achieve what it was for the day's goals. The reason this is so important is that if you're just doing something because somebody else asks you to, at some point, you're going to lose the fire inside of you or you're going to think it's just for them. You're not going to have connected it to how it's actually helping benefit you or connected it to how you've already been seeking benefits in your life. And then they're not going to give you the response they want one day. And you're going to say, well, F it. Why am I even trying if they're not going to be doting all over me because I made coffee for them in the morning? All right, so you got to figure out that making the coffee becomes the way that you show them love and connection, right? And you want to show them love and connection because you want them to show you love and connection back. And at some point, hedonistic adaptation will take over, and what what you're doing will just become the the norm, right? And it may not seem to stand out as much as it used to, but nonetheless, it still shows them at an unconscious level that you care. But if you're not connecting it with how you care for yourself inside yourself, you're not going to maintain it. As much as we want to do things for other people, we're, all, we're actually doing things for ourselves. There's just an external benefit for somebody else. You can try to, to push back on that idea that everybody does things for themselves, not against you. You can try to push back on it. But if you really step back, take on that third-party observer and notice why you do things. You might say, well, I, you know, I take out the garbage so that my wife won't yell at me. Okay, you think you're taking out the garbage for, for your wife. But in reality, you are doing it for yourself because you don't want to be yelled at or you don't want to be belittled or you don't want to have to spend time in an argument when it takes 10 seconds to take out the garbage. So you think, well, I'm only taking the garbage out for the wife so she doesn't yell at me. Okay, then here's an idea. Why don't you both decide to not take out the garbage for a week? And just let it sit there and pile up all over the floor. And when the rats and the roaches show up, then let's decide if what you're really trying to do is take out the garbage so you don't have rats and roaches in your house. You're actually doing it for yourself. You tried to blame it on the wife or blame it on the husband, but it really was an internally motivated desire to not have rats and roaches running all over your damn house. So you can try to push back on this idea, but I'm telling you, if you really third-party observer it, you'll realize that that person making fun of you for your, your shoes just wants to make themselves feel better for the way they dress, or they're feeling powerless today, so they feel like if they mock you and bully you, that they'll feel, they, they get that little emotional surge from feeling like they're better than someone else. You are the external ob- object for which they are putting their internal pain upon. And it's up to you to heal through your own trauma so you don't do that to somebody else. And when you begin to internalize your goals as things that are for you, because this is who you want to become, because anyone on this planet could, could opt out of your life at any given moment. They could, they could, they could leave, they could die, they could, whatever the way, right? And so if you're only doing something for somebody else, and then you're not getting the reaction, the response that you want, or they leave, or they go away, Right. Well, what if going to the gym every day is really beneficial so that when you're 75, you can still move around like you're 55, then you want to be doing that for yourself. 
if they say, wow, I'd really like it for you to be, you know, able to uh, move around, you know, lose some weight now because I want this version of you in front of me now, right? Well, you could say, actually, I want that version of me too. So that 75, I'm moving around like I'm 55 and I'm still thinking I'm 45. This is why I care so much about my body now. I'm not really necessarily doing it for 45-year-old Jesse as much as I'm doing it for 55, 65, 75, 85, and 95-year-old Jesse. The habits that I am creating in my life now become the version of myself that I am then. And the benefits that I don't maybe even get to enjoy now are absolutely going to be experienced then. And that's how I can tie these these desires and these goals into my life, I can root them in so deeply that it just becomes habitual for me to go to the gym three days a week, for me to watch walk, walk 10,000 steps a day. It becomes so habitual because I realize each day I do this is leading me exactly to the destination that I desire. But it's within the journey that I actually accomplish it. The journey, when you get there, it's like, okay, great, you're here. Right, so you, you, you've made it to that finish line, but the accomplishing, it happened all along the way. The last step may have gotten you over the finish line, but it was the journey all along the way that got you there. It's sort of like birthdays. You're really only one day older, but now all of a sudden you've got to tack a year onto your age. For 364 days, you were aging. It's just on the 365th day, we decide that we're actually going to add it up into our overall age. But you've been aging the entire way. You were growing the entire time. Just now on this day is the day that you officially have to change what you say to people when they ask you your age. Because no one's walking around going, well, I'm 45 years and 217 days old. We're not doing it that way. It's the same thing with any goal in life. Yes, there will be a day where you'll officially step down on that finish line and say, I, boom, I got here. But the growth, that was the other 364 days. The last step was day 365 that got you there. But guess what? 366 is happening tomorrow. So even when you get to the destination, you've already decided on another destination once you've gotten to the predetermined destination. There's always going to be another destination. So if all you're looking forward to is the destination, then you're never getting to enjoy any of it because as soon as you got to the destination, you already had another destination set. This is like watching football players talk about the season. It's like, oh, got to work harder, got to work harder. Well, we did good, but we still got more work to do. And it's like they're not enjoying any aspect of the season. And then for 20 minutes at the end of the season, if they're lucky enough to be a Tom Brady, they get to hold up a, a, a trophy, smile, then they hand the trophy over, they get up off the stage, and then the, then the next thing they're thinking of is, okay, got to get ready for next season. What? You just spent 364 days trying to get back to this freaking trophy ceremony, and you gave yourself 20 minutes to enjoy it? Oh, well, I'll enjoy it more when I'm retired. Not the way you would if you just enjoyed it right now as it was literally happening. So enjoy it while it's happening. Tie it to your internal sense of self, what you're seeking to achieve in you. And you'll, you will be able to maintain it. It'll be something that you can keep up with. Now I'll get you out of here on this. We can feel pretty confident everything I've just discussed over the last 38 or so minutes is accurate. Because if it, if it, if there was other ways to have experiences where it would have worked, it would have stuck more. And, I, and I'm saying this leading directly to this. How many times before we actually quit using did somebody look at us who cared about us and said, please, please, I see what you're doing to yourself and it's killing me watching you kill yourself. And we still didn't stop. We see the, the, the scarred, dirty lungs on the side of the pack of cigarettes. We're told by everybody that the longer we smoke, the closer we are to the next cancer stick that's going to make sure that we die an early death, and we still kept smoking. It wasn't until we discovered an internal fire within ourselves that was like, nope, nope, the pain of continuing is way more than the pain that will be caused by quitting. I'm ready to start to make that change. Once we internalized it, we were actually able to continue it. We were able to maintain it, and it became who we are. It worked the same. It worked that way with our addiction. It worked that way with our using. So how is it we sensed it there? Once I internalized it, I was able to make it. Even if your spouse said, either quit or get out of the house, right? You still ultimately decided that what you wanted more than the the using was the love and connection that came from them. So you chose love and connection over the disconnection of using. Now, it might take a long time to heal to get to back to that point of deep connection, but you chose connection the day you chose to quit over continuing. 
it worked in that aspect of your life. Let's then utilize that, right? Because if, if you can, if you can measure it, then you can, re- uh, then you can replicate it, which means that you can maintain it. If it's not, if you if you can't measure it, then you can't replicate it. So we've already been able to measure it. Once I internalized why I should quit using, I was able to do that. Right, and then you could measure it. Each day you were one more day deeper into your sobriety and one day further away from your addiction. So we already figured out how to measure that awesome area of our lives. Now let's bring this in and replicate it in every aspect of our lives. Internalize why something needs to be done. Internalize the goal. Attach it to something that's super important to your values, your morals, your ethics, your belief system. And when you attach it internally, it will absolutely be displayed externally. And then not only are you benefiting inside yourself, but you're able to help everybody else around you benefit from experiencing the new you. And over the course of days and weeks and months and years, this just becomes the new norm. And before you know it, people don't even see you as somebody in sobriety and recovery. They just see you as this amazing, awesome version of yourself that you have been creating every single day. The benefit is ahead. It's absolutely attainable. Now, today, take one more step closer to that version of yourself. It takes you one step further away from your old version of yourself. And it helps you keep promises to yourself, which creates this beautiful feedback loop that you are worthy and you are capable and that this will work. And that, my friends, is how we start to reach our highest sense of self. We finish up this year strong, we rock it into the next year, and each and every single day, we set upon the intention to better ourselves. And when we do that, man oh man, every day really, truly is the best day of our lives because we wake up sober. As always, my friends, inclusivity over exclusivity, the power of positive energy, release and flow. You want more? You want more of this? You want more? of how to get into the tribe, of how to have this on a regular basis. You want to know how you get a hold of my cell phone number? You join the tribe. You want to be more into this? You want to be on the Voxer channel? You want to be experiencing how other people are taking this material and bettering themselves each and every day? Hit me up on Instagram, from sobriety to recovery, at Jesse Mogul. You can always email me from sobriety to recovery at gmail.com. I am here It is your turn. Stand up, step forward, raise your hand, and I will call on you because every day truly is the best day of our lives when we wake up sober. Shout out to Sunshine. Glow on. See you next week. Bye-bye.